Tiny Hearts Lecture Series today, I would like to remind everyone to please mute their microphones and uh, we will have comments and questions in the chat box at the end of the presentation. Today we have Dr. Amy Hare joining us. She's currently an associate professor in the section of neonatology and the Department of Pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine. She's also the program director for neonatal nutrition and the co-director of the NICU intestinal rehab program at Texas Children's Hospital. She received her undergraduate degree in biology at the University of Georgia and her medical degree from the Medical College of Georgia in Augustus. Augusta. Her postgraduate training included pediatrics residency at University of Virginia and postdoctoral fellowships in neonatal and perinatal medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, as well as nutrition at the USDA Agricultural Research, Research Service Center uh, as part of the Children's Nutrition Research Center in Houston. Her research focuses on neonatal nutrition, specifically growth and the use of human milk in very low birth weight infants. She's the principal <laughs> investigator for multiple ongoing research studies and was recently awarded an R01 from the NIH to study fatty acid absorption in preterm infants. Dr. Hare is recognized nationally as an expert in human milk and neonatal nutrition, and we are so happy to have her here today with us. All right, thank you so much for the kind introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, Allison, can you see these? Or I guess just tell me if you yes. can't. Okay. Yes, we see them. Sorry, team, but despite the pandemic and uh, we use a lot more Zoom, Teams I sometimes messes up on my computer. So anyways, thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you. So um, I a lot of my research focuses on the use of human milk and neonatal nutrition, but um, I also really love the babies with congenital heart disease and have had the opportunity to work with our cardiac ICU for the past uh, 10, 11 years working on nutrition up there. So I'm just going to talk to you about some of our feeding practices here at Texas Children's and share some of the literature. So just to start with our neonatal nutrition program, and I think um, a lot of people know about us, but uh, our NICU is 173 bed NICU, and we are actually adding on 30 beds within the next year. So we have three different units. Um, complex unit, a step-down unit, and then a level three inborn unit. And so I have the pleasure of working with our neonatal dietitians and a large multidisciplinary team, um, you know, making sure all of our babies uh, get the best nutrition possible. And like I said, I um, have had a great collaboration with our and in that unit as well. And so um, for disclosures, I am the site PI for the Neonatal Nutrition Collaborative. It's sponsored by Meade Johnson and led by Dr. Cami Martin. Uh, my other disclosure is uh, I'm from Houston and actually Texas originally. So um, it, it's a large state and uh, just like that, our hospital is large as well as our NICU. And so today, what I'm going to talk to you about, um, one, going over some of the literature regarding feeding practices in babies with congenital heart disease, and talking about the benefits of human milk in this population, and then go over some recent studies of the use of human milk for these babies. And so a lot of, um, I think, our practice in taking care of these uh, infants is that, you know, there, there hasn't been a lot of data for years. And so we extrapolated a lot of what we've done in the NICU. And actually, this was probably my biggest selling point when I um, started working with a cardiac ICU. Um, you know, their fear of neck is real. They do see uh, necrotizing aerocolitis a lot. And so, you know, I just said, look, if I can feed a 400 gram baby um, at some point, then I think we can figure out a way to, you know, better feed um, infants with heart disease. And I think, um, I know on the call, there's a mix of neonatologists, cardiologists, and um, I'm, I'm sure there's some ICU folks on here, but I think um, the surgeons have been able to really um, kind of uh, 
um, hone in on their practices regarding surgeries and we're, you know, able to kind of take care, at least, uh, you know, palliate some of this complex heart disease. And so uh, we have an even newer population, but on top of that, um, we're figuring out how to take care of a lot of heart disease. So then I think there can be a little bit more focus on nutrition and um, these babies that require surgery. And so I think because of that, there just has been, I mean, I think in general, you know, even in neonatal nutrition, um, there's been a lot more interest recently, but there, and neonatology in general, there's um, a limited amount of studies because we haven't been around that long. And so for feeding these babies with congenital heart disease, and specifically a lot of what I'll be talking today, I, I'm saying congenital heart disease, but um, I'm more referring to higher risk babies, uh, single ventricle physiology, um, some ductal dependent physiology. So kind of the, the sicker end of the babies. But they're, you know, just like in neonatology, I think neonatology has a little bit more consistency in some of our feeding protocols and how we feed babies. Um, but again, you know, this um, newer population of single ventricle babies, there there is a lack of kind of overall consensus. There's no prospective studies that have been done, and there are very few human milk studies. And I will say um, there are some great collaboratives that have um, started really making some progress, um, and I have some of those listed at the end, like PC4, et cetera. And so there is a movement towards standardizing how to feed these babies. But um, I just wanted to, you know, I went into Google Images and just put enteral feeding protocol pictures and, you know, they're, they're all different kinds. I'm sure everyone on this call has their own um, protocol. And the, the problem though, is that a lot of these babies have unique physiology or um, the way they're being cared for, you know, some people have more comfort in feeding infants over others. And so kind of multi-center well-designed studies still need to be conducted in this population. And even um, this was a study at practices. It was a survey looking at European NICUs, um, excuse me, PICUs. And, you know, one of the main findings was just there's an absence of local protocols and scientific society endorsed guidelines. And again, um, this is changing and improving. So I'm excited to continue to follow um, kind of the standardization of some of these practices. But just kind of this um, is showing you, that, you know, a lot of what's been studied is single centered, um, a lot of it's retrospective. And so one of the things we started doing, this was um, published in 2019, Jasmine Kataria Hale, one of our former fellows who's now a neonatologist, um, you know, wanted to kind of look at some of this and figure out you know, um, how do we how do we feed babies preoperatively and what's in the literature? Because we've had protocols here for some time, but um, this was kind of an opportunity um, for us in a multidisciplinary fashion to kind of review the literature. And the way our, um, you know, we've had various models of caring for these babies in between our NICU and the CVICU. And so, um, it's a little different now, but it used to be that um, NICU would take care of babies pre-op and CVIC would take care of babies post-op. And now um, with the expansion of um, an entire like floor for infant uh, cardiac babies, it's more on the CVICU side now. But I bring that up because that's kind of where some of the interest in neonatologists uh, came from and taking care of this population, trying to figure out how to feed them. But um, from this systematic review, Jasmine found that the majority of studies focus on post-operative feeding and hospital outcomes, and that there, there's not a lot of evidence to say that you can't feed a baby preoperatively, but it just further emphasizes the need for well-designed prospective studies. And so in the NICU world, um, you know, we I think one of the most hated illnesses is necrotizing enterocolitis, you know, this devastating intestinal disease that often leads to um, bowel ischemia, sometimes surgical removal of bowel, and it's one of the highest causes of mortality in the preterm population. And um, we know cardiac infants are at risk for this as well. And some of the thought is that there's um, decreased perfusion to the mesentery, and that especially in a ductal dependent lesion, um, you can have vascular steel from the gut. And then the concern is that 
you have ischemia and and then injury of the gut. And I have some pictures to show. This is um was published in 2023 by um uh, in January by Misty Goods Group, and I just think it's a um, great new newer figure looking at necrotizing or colitis. Now this is in the preterm infant population, but what we do know is risk factors for neck in that population being preterm. Um, receiving, not receiving breast milk, um, having a lot of antibiotic exposure, and then dysbiosis. And so this was published uh, in the past year by um, Hala Shaban and um, Burge et al., just kind of giving a different schematic. It's like a proposed schematic for what we think happens in the cardiac infants in regards to NAC. But it, going back to that hypoxia and hypoperfusion of the gut, so gut ischemia. And then uh, what happens is you get inflammation, um, you get cytokine release, which damages intestinal cells, and then you kind of get leaky um, vessels here in inflammation there as well. And then there's bacterial translocation, so bad bacteria that causes issues, and then you have your, your damage here to the intestine. So slightly different proposed pathology um, related more to blood flow. And so, you know, I think um, we're comfortable sometimes just not feeding babies because we think the risk, um, you know, goes down regarding NAC and, and complications. But we do know that when we don't feed it, the intestine, there's atrophy of intestinal mucosa, that um, there's some kind of loss of important intestinal cell wall barriers, motility issues, so kind of stasis in the gut, which can cause bacterial overgrowth and other issues, and, um, you know, overall kind of delayed intestinal development and maturation. And so when we start thinking about the use of human milk for, um, you know, we use it in the preterm population, but also using it and emphasizing its use in the cardiac population. And so we know that for the breastfed baby, this is a term baby, just showing kind of the head to toe benefit that studies have found um, with breastfeeding. And we know that, that um, that's a benefit. And then for the preterm population, we know that babies that receive more human milk, uh, specifically mom's milk, have decreased neck decreased uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, chronic lung disease, possibly improved neurodevelopmental outcomes and less sepsis. And so um, the thought is that if we're giving, um, you know, the right components of breast, uh, breast milk and human milk to babies and even these cardiac infants, maybe it would lead to a more healthy intestinal microbiota if we can all agree on what healthy is, but something that is more protective of a microbiota in the intestine versus negative. And so, you know, I probably need to redo this slide because we are, but this is like some of the highlights of the non-nutritional components of human milk. But um, I think as technology is improving um, and research is growing in this field of human milk, we are learning um, just so many different factors, enzymes, et cetera, that are in human milk. So it's not just about nutrition. And so um, even with digestive enzymes like lipase, there's uh, antimicrobial components like lactoferrin, and we know secretory IgA, but there is a, a whole other list um, kind of, of components that are immunomodulatory that are in human milk. And so kind of putting this all together and thinking about the preterm neonate and thinking about um, infants with significant congenital heart disease. So is it safe to feed these babies with ductal dependent congenital heart disease preoperatively? So I'll talk about post-op later, but preoperatively, could we at least feed the gut a little before they have surgery? And um, do the benefits outweigh the risk? And does it matter what type of lesion they have, cardiac lesion? So um, also, just feeding infants with congenital heart disease confer the same benefits as it does for preterm infants? And does it lead to improved outcomes in this population just like it does in preterm infants? And so this was um, a, another former fel fellow, Acacia Cognata, and then Jasmeet helped with this project as well. But we took a look, again, trying to gather data so we could further look at our protocols on how to feed babies with complex congenital heart disease 
This is retrospective at our center. It was 546 infants between 2010 and 2016. So feeling like older data now, I don't know where the years are going, but we wanted to look at the risk of preoperative neck in relationship to human milk feeding. And we found that overall incidence for the population for preoperative neck is 3.3%, which is um, on the lower end, but overall preoperatively, and I, I don't know if that's because we usually don't feed these babies. The rate of neck is, is on the lower side. But what we found is that feeding exclusive human milk, so unfortified milk, was associated with a significantly lower risk of preoperative neck. And so, um, and we say unfortified because some babies, um, I guess, over the years have been fortified before they had surgery. And so uh, when we say human milk, this also included donor human milk. So We've been using um, donor pasteurized donor milk here at Texas Children's since 2009. And I would say um, it, at least 11, 12 years, we've been using it in the cardiac population. And so this was kind of one of our first go rounds about um, looking at preoperative feeding and how can we make this possible and um, get babies to, to full feeds uh, sooner. And this is, from a study that we published. And I have another chart later on that I'll actually go through this in a little bit more detail. But basically, um, we were just trying to get any type of um, human milk into these babies' intestines prior to surgery if they met certain criteria that we agreed upon. So this is a multidisciplinary feeding protocol that we met with neonatology, cardiology, and the cardiac ICU. And so I'll talk about this in a minute, but we started with really emphasizing the use of um, mother's own milk, but the use of colostrum for oral care. Kind of making sure that even if a baby isn't too fed um, to their intestine, at least they're getting oral care with breast milk. And um, this is important. You're probably wondering like why, you know, why put this in the protocol? Well, we realized that um, some of the depended on um, practices and over the years, but um, mouth care and these infants was we we found out was uh, they use sterile water or in one um, case, some cases they use chlorhexidine because that is used in the pediatric population to decrease ventilator induced pneumonia. And so um, which is just a foreign concept to me coming from the NICU. And so that's when we decided, okay, well, can we at least do oral care with mother's colostrum? That's where that comes from. But we agreed upon certain factors that would have to, you know, um, exist, like more stability signs before starting feeds. And then I will go through this in a little bit. But just to show you, kind of, we started this protocol, but the focus was really on oral care with colostrum. And um, Jasmine made kind of Put together kits for moms and we basically just started education very early starting in the first visit that um, mom had before delivery kind of meeting with a cardiac team and figuring um, neonatology etc and so just trying to emphasize like why for the cardiac population or just babies in general you know human milk is important mother's milk especially and this was also um targeted just to say you know, your baby's going to be for us, um, the delivery hospital and the cardiac ICU units are pretty far apart. So, I mean, same hospital, but it's like a five minute walk. And so um, we were emphasizing to moms like you're not going to see your baby um, initially for a while. So start pumping and uh, collecting any milk you have uh, for oral care with colostrum. And so um, there's kind of more data coming out about oral care with colostrum. I think most um, or many NICUs have moved towards this because I think intuitively it makes sense. Also, there's some studies um, showing that, you know, there's increased um, uh, secretory IgA and lactoferrin, et cetera, found in these babies that receive oral care. Like I know Rich Chandler has a paper where um, in the urine, they found like increased lactoferrin and babies that received oral care delivery, not just the swab inside the cheeks, but as you can see here with the syringes and that that it was hypothesized that syringe delivery um, was a little bit more successful. I don't know if it's dose related as well. And I know um, Nancy Rodriguez has led a lot of this literature and she published a recent trial um, as a follow up to 
kind of some of her early papers. And I'm not sure that the benefits are exactly um, what we expected from that, but um, I, I think that it's definitely something, if anything, it just gets mom pumping. And I do think that these babies benefit from it. And so what I wanna show you is just by implementing that feeding protocol and working with moms, trying to emphasize the use of mother's milk, and um, early colostrum for oral care, we were basically able to uh, get rid of the use of formula preoperatively and um, before surgery in these infants after our protocol was implemented. So we went from 42% to no formula use. And so part of this too was just emphasizing if we don't have mom's milk. So we were fortunate, a lot of moms were really um, participate in the study and wanted to provide um, milk early on, but if they were unable to provide milk for various factors, we uh, supplemented with pasteurized donor human milk, although we did not do oral care with donor milk for that this particular study. So we were really excited about this, and I think this is um, accumulation of kind of just all of our collaboration and kind of furthering nutrition in these cardiac babies. I think, um, it, you know, it was just, it was interesting to me that um, I think a lot of um, neonatologists, you know, just we've moved away from using formula in our uh, very low birth weight infants early on. And um, some of our cardiac ICU doctors, which were more pediatric trained, um, didn't have that same experience. And so once we kind of uh, collaboratively worked together there, we were significantly able to reduce formula use. And so, um, so I've been at TCH. I might be on year 15 now. Um, I should probably count that again. But um, we have been working with um, our cardiology colleagues for a long time on this. And some of the barriers, and I, and I bring this up because I think a lot of us have our own challenges and we've tried to look at what can we improve. But we're trying to figure out what have our challenges been over the years um, in delivering, you know, or improving the use of mother's own milk in the cardiac ICU. And a couple of things, I think they're they're small, but really important. But there were no dedicated uh, refrigerators like there are, we have in our NICU for uh, breast milk. And so like, you know, 13 years ago, it was a part of a fridge that was a dietary fridge. There was a special portion for the milk, but no dedicated, um, you know, fridge just for breast milk. And so having that and, um, I don't know if they like me to tell this story, but we have this 22 floor legacy tower that they built um, for for the cardiology and surgery. And for whatever reason, um, there were no fridges designed in the cardiac ICU for the infant one. Um, we figured that out, but we were able to fix that pretty quickly. Um, so I think it was looked over, but we have this nice new fancy unit and no place to put breast milk. Um, we were limited in our lactation support. I will say I'm very proud that we now have a, we have, a, I think, believe, a 24-7 dedicated lactation consultant uh, for the cardiac ICU. But we also, um, I know our lactation department has done a great job um, enlisting the cardiac nurses and working with them on how to improve breastfeeding and also just improving education across the board for providers and um, parents, et cetera. And, you know, I think for the fear of necrotizing our colitis is not going to go away, but I do think um, there is some slight reassurance with using or comfort more with breast milk. And so maybe more likely to feed if it's mom's milk and um, supplement with pasteurized donor milk. And then um, we have developed protocols over time and changed them as we've needed to. And, and I say this kindly with the nutrition doesn't matter comment because you know, I think, again, the field has advanced so far in the care for these complex um, congenital heart disease babies that the focus was just trying to keep the heart working and, to, you know, medically take care of the baby pre and post operatively. And now that that's more standardized and, and we're kind of improving on that side, there is more time to focus on nutrition for this population. And so we do have a combined approach. So we uh, call it the Neo Heart Collaborative. And we, um, so it kind of brings together anyone that basically from the NICU to cardiac ICU and in between where um, infants are that would receive human milk. 
And so we meet and talk about a lot of um, projects, like for instance, we're working on a project with Epic, which is our um, EMR system. And it's important that if we change one flow sheet in the NICU, we need to change it in the cardiac ICU as a flow sheet on how to document oral care with colostrum. And so um, it's been neat to work in that multidisciplinary group, but we also do nutrition rounds. I haven't mentioned Jeremy Roddy, but he is uh, my partner up in the cardiac ICU and he, uh, we used to lead them together. Now he leads nutrition rounds. So meeting with the dietitians and supporting them regarding um, cardiac nutrition for their babies in complex cases. And then it brings together our neonatal nutrition group. And so um, I'm going to be showing you the protocols I said that I would be going, um, you know, going through. We recently worked with uh, Cynthia Blanco and her group. Um, we we have similar practices. Um, so for the most part, I think what's published in this clinics and perinatology um, chapter is similar to what we use and for our neonates. But um, this, as you can see, this is very similar to what we used in um, Dr. Kataria Hill's study. And so preoperative feeding for these babies. So again, emphasizing the use of um, mother's milk and colostrum for oral care, and then continue it until the first um, surgery. We actually currently continue oral care with mom's milk until babies are orally feeding. Um, so even that would go through post-op and on until they're fully orally feeding. And that's kind of extrapolated from our practice in the NICU. And then prior to starting feeds, we um, these are the agreed upon criteria that I was going to go through. So, you know, a low and stable lactate trend preoperatively, good urine output, um, making sure diastolic blood pressures and blood pressures stable and appropriate, good NEARS trends. And then um, generally they're not on a lot of pressor support. And then, um, you know, I think this is something that we have dealt with in neonatology is it's okay. Oh, a computer just completely went dead. Sorry, everybody, for that. That is the first time this has ever happened where um, it must be a TCH network issue. Um, I've actually never had that happen. So I will go back to what we were talking about. I'm very sorry. Yeah, strangest thing. Okay, hopefully we're back in business now. Yeah, you're good. Okay, I just need to... All right, we're good. Sorry about that. Wow. Well, at least it's only happened once while I'm giving lectures. Actually, it's the only time that's ever happened on Teams. So going back to what I was talking about, um, 
So we were talking about we've struggled with this in neonatology feeding with the UAC in place, but we um, I think are OK if the baby is not on pressors and is in a more relatively stable standpoint. And then also um, even on prostaglandins, we'll feed preoperatively a very small amount, but as long as they meet these other criteria. And generally, um, we will start kind of like how we feed our preemies here, where we start at what we call trophic feeds of 20 mLs per kilo per day and uh, divide it every three hours. And we generally don't advance for 24 hours. Sometimes um, they'll choose to do continuous feeds. And um, I'm OK with that because the baby's on TPN. It generally, my only concern with continuous feeds for more preterm babies is that most of their calories or half their calories come from fat. And if you're doing continuous feeds with just plain breast milk, you will lose a good amount of fat just from the tubing um, and the feeding alone. And then um, the maximum feeds we'd increase by 20 mLs per kilo per day, a day per day up to about 40 to 60 mLs per kilo per day. And I will say there is a lot more comfort with oral feeding. So um, there's um, a strong thought. Now, I haven't been able to find a lot of evidence, but the thought is that um, if babies, babies will self-limit if they're orally feeding. And so if they're having some type of um, feeding intolerance or intestinal issue, they will not feed by mouth. And so you know, the problem is, is if we have a sicker baby that's intubated, but we will do really low volume uh, feeds, even in those babies, uh, tube feeds. And so this is um, post-operative. So I know I've talked a lot about pre-operative, and I think I'm talking a little less about post-operative because um, these babies are taken care of by our cardiac ICU folks. And so um, while they've kept us kind of involved uh, in the nutrition, um, we have less presence um, in the care at this time. But this actually protocol came from um, a study that I'm going to show you in a minute if we don't run out of time. Um, but basically, it was a multi center agreed upon protocol, slightly altered for this publication. Um, Cynthia and I kind of made our own touches to it. But basically, post operatively, how do you feed a baby? When do you fortify, et cetera? So you're gonna, uh, we talked about, you know, starting feeds postoperatively once a baby is quote, stable and meets criteria. And then starting with just plain um, breast milk or pasteurized donor milk, I will say we tend towards using more pasteurized donor milk if we don't have mom's milk available. But as these are term babies, um, we will use some formula depend, depending on the infant, but basically starting at a low volume, like we did preoperatively at 20 per kilo per day. I know some centers prefer continuous feeds and that's an option as well. And after a few days, um, we can advance a little bit more. Generally, I, I would say we're generally on the 20 per kilo per day side of advancement. And you're probably wondering the purple and the pink, but um, that's supposed to kind of talk about their mixing lesions and their saturation. So um, if you have a more low risk acyanotic lesion, um, you can probably go uh, on the faster end between 20 to 40 mLs per kilo per day. And then I know these are term babies. And so you're probably wondering, why are you telling me to fortify these babies? But a lot of times they're very fluid restricted due to medications, due to their overall um, heart disease status. And so to get them the goal protein and energy intake they need, we do recommend fortifying at 80 to 100 mLs per kilo per day, up to 24 cal per ounce. And um, usually using formula for that age group on top of the use of mom's milk. And then continuing to advance to whatever goal feeds are fluid restriction wise for that baby. And then if needed, um, you know, I say we don't have to do it very often, but if a baby is severely fluid restricted, lower than um, even 130, we may have to increase the fortification beyond 24 calories per ounce. And I've also learned uh, working with my colleagues that 24 calories per ounce is kind of a very comfortable range for them going above that. Um, I think there's there's just concern about intolerance and the risk of neck. Um, but like I said, most times these are term babies. They need a little less nutrition than a preterm infant. So we might be able to get away with 24 calories per ounce. Now, after starting trophic feeds, the high-risk lesions, these are, you know, our cyanotic lesions postoperatively. 
um, might might throw in some prematurity there, um, even a late preterm baby, um, and some of these babies are growth restricted. And so there's uh, two suggestions. So the formula group, generally, we would advance by the same 20 per kilo per day, and we would get up to 100 per kilo per day and then fortify with formula to 24 calories per ounce. And um, I will say for for a good number of years, especially when we were conducting the study that I'm going to present to you next, we fortified with elemental formula because we were um, trying to use the most broken down source of formula possible. The problem is that's hard to expensive and hard to get as an outpatient. So I do think um, the cardiac ICU has moved to a more partially uh, partially hydrolyzed protein formula. And then um, let's see, you get to your goal volume and then maybe increase calories. You know, um, occasionally we have to go up to 30 calories per ounce, but we try not to do that. The other option that this is not commercially available yet, there is a recipe that you can use with the Premi donor human milk drive fortifier uh, to make a more term fortifier. But this was part of a study. And um, like I said, the product's not available yet, but it's basically um, similar to the um, donor human milk drive fortifier for preemies, but it's designed to meet the nutritional needs and not give overnutrition to these term cardiac babies. But if you have access or use that fortifier, you can fortify at 60 per kilo per day, um, up to 24. And that's mainly because 24 is the comfort zone for everyone when we designed this protocol. And then once you get to 100 per kilo feeds, you can go up to 26 calories per ounce. Because again, it's a donor milk drive fortifier. So it's made from breast milk. Um, the osms are on the lower end as you increase fortification. And so the thought is that you can go a little bit higher and then you get to goal feeds. So this is kind of what we use. And um, what I was gonna add, we have about um, 20 minutes left. And just to kind of, um, I'll just quickly go through this just because I think it's, it's interesting. We participated in this study. Um, and uh, it was multi-center study looking at single ventricle physiology and using exclusive human milk diet. And so um, really the goal of this study, I mean, we were hoping that we would see just overall um, improved feeding intolerance and um, outcomes in these babies, but you know, for the sample size calculation, et cetera. And Dr. Blanco led this study um, and we, Texas Children's was the second um, actually, I think we had the largest population in the study. But anyways, we the sample size is based on weight gain 30 days after the initiation of feeds following cardiac surgery. And um, the I, let's see, I'm not sure if I have the feeding protocol. Sorry about that. So it was basically kind of what I showed you in the last two arms of this group. So there was either... Um, formula given as the fortifier, or there was the donor human milk drive fortifier, and babies were randomized to one group or the other, and, and not given complete formula. So if there was mom's milk available, um, of course, we would use that first and fortify that with formula. And then if it wasn't available, we we give formula. So there were 10 centers, and um, one thing that is a distinction by a lot of work is that uh, preoperatively, all these babies received human milk. So if they were fed preoperatively, they got mom's milk or pasteurized donor milk. So they started off the same with that. And then postoperatively, they were randomized to which feeding intervention. And um, I had gone over, basically the human milk group, exclusive human milk group was fortified earlier and advanced on calories quicker than the formula group, because the formula group was our control practice that um, everyone agreed upon. And so just looking at, I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, we looked at a lot of different outcomes and we did find um, that babies that received exclusive human milk did have better growth velocity. And so um, that was one of our findings. But also, again, we were not powered to look at NAC, but um, neck with suspected neck, so neck rollouts, um, there was less cases of that. So 15% in the control compared to 3.6 in the exclusive human milk group. And um, 
I will tell you again, the product's not available and I'm not pushing for it, but I will say we were blinded to what group the babies were in, but one group um, did very well. Like it was, you know, we could tell who is on the, we, we could tell one group did great, like so great that they would try to get them out the door at like 20, 25 days post-op because the study was 30 days and we would have to switch them to a home diet and that usually slowed down their progress. And so um, I would say from like a feeding intolerance standpoint, it was much lower um, in the exclusive human milk group. And this is similar to protocol I showed you. And we had um, a standardized protocol for evaluating um, feeding intolerance and neck in this population. And just kind of there were just to show you this, um, Cynthia put together a lot of this data and it, um, it's, I think it's pretty extensive for nutrition type data, but basically just showing you um, each step, each color, like red, blue, green, orange, each color is a higher level of fortification. And so as you can see that, um, I don't have this labeled, but this is the uh, control group and this is the intervention group. And you can tell that Orange is more calories. Those babies were started much sooner um, and received the higher calories um, than the control group. And you can see it depicted here as well. And if you're interested, there's all kinds of breakdown of their enteral protein, et cetera. And this is just looking at um, growth velocity for all these babies um, and looking at, um, you know, the blue line is just showing the more positive trend for growth for study babies that got the exclusive human milk diet. So we did find improved short term growth and decreased neck, although we weren't powered for that. Um, and the babies that received an exclusive human milk diet and we are doing neurodevelopmental follow up. So we'll have that piece to add as well. And so um, we will have lots of time for questions um, just to kind of talk about what I talked today. So we do know that babies with complex congenital heart disease have, um, you know, unique nutritional challenges. And just like in our preemie population and our cardiac babies, we should definitely focus on the use of mother's milk and ways to optimize that. Even if it's buying, you know, a fridge just for breast milk in the unit, or um, we've had a lot of success with just education and prenatal education for the moms. And then, um, I would vote to consider supplementation with pasteurized donor milk if you don't have mom's milk, if you're feeding preoperatively, because our data does suggest um, that human milk preoperatively is protective. And it's, you know, it's not that much donor milk. I just want to say I recognize that uh, donor milk is a resource, and I know we want to save it for our preemies, less than 1,500 grams birth weight. Um, but these babies are fed such minimum volumes preoperatively that I think it's it's a low amount. I will tell you that um, once the CBIC became um, very comfortable with the use of donor milk, uh, we occasionally had a baby that, you know, was like two months old, still on donor milk. I think the families requested it and, you know, that flags us in our milk bank. I'm the director of the milk bank and we have a kind of flag for if a baby's getting more than a liter of donor milk a day that we need to evaluate like the need because again, we want to conserve resources. So occasionally a baby will creep outside that, but generally it's just a short-term use while mom is pumping in the preoperative period. And then um, the study I showed you was single ventricle physiology. There were some benefits, um, it appears, from the babies that received uh, a donor human milk derived fortifier. And um, these are probably out. I, apo I, I apologize that I did not fully uh, pull them for this study, but I know that there are several societies working on guidelines. Um, and there are some studies looking at donor milk use. I'm not sure there'll be anything um, prospectively conducted, but maybe. Um, and then we have some data coming from our center looking at babies who received majority human milk um, versus babies that received majority formula. And we're looking at their neurodevelopmental outcomes and we're seeing some differences in these babies because we know that especially the complex babies with single ventricle physiology, they are at huge risk for um, long term impairment, um, kind of delay and their neurodevelopmental milestones. And so um, something to kind of focus on 
And so I couldn't do it without my large team kind of listed here and those that have contributed to the work. And um, it's just been really cool to see um, our nutrition change over time and um, see these heart babies doing so well. And I do want to bring up the, it's my shout out for the Necrotizing Enterocolitis Society. Um, I've been on the Scientific Advisory Council since 2014. And this organization was started by Jen and Aaron, who both sadly lost their babies to um, their preterm babies to NAC. And so um, we are moving the field forward and we love help. And anyone interested in doing any type of NAC related research, and uh, we do have a symposium coming up in August that um, is, if you look at the agenda, it, there are different tracks. There's a lot of speakers um, and a lot, a lot of great things that we're going to talk about there. So just to consider that 